Hey again, YouTube. We are back with our DC-powered hacky C64 thing that uh, I was playing with, oh, I don't know, must have been six months ago now, eight months ago now, quite a while ago. Um, so this is this is kind of a culmination of, of many different projects and, and different iterations of things. So I'll spare you all the all the uh, you know crappy video of me soldering and desoldering and doing strange things and, and just kind of bring you to the to the uh, current state of the union with this thing. So here we'll we'll start in the power section and then move on to the new fun things, right? Um, so uh, this machine looking for a pointer but we'll just use our finger so this machine has uh, just a, a DC barrel jack feed in it there's nothing but DC voltage coming into this um, so it comes into that barrel jack goes through the switch hits this little guy this is an XL 4015 uh, voltage buck converter you know it's a, a switch mode step down regulator uh, you know buck converter kind of thing so again XL 4015 I'll put a link down below they're, uh, they're, they're cheap and reliable. They're, uh, supposedly they'll do five amps. Um, uh, we're not drawn anywhere near that and I probably wouldn't run them at their max, but they seem stable up to a couple of amps at least. So, um, I'm pretty satisfied with it. So, um, that the, uh, so obviously go the, the inputs on the back here, that's what comes out of our switch. Our output feeds where, uh, you used to have a couple of diodes, uh, for rectification in the original C64 power supply design. Um, Obviously, they're not populated. Most of the stuff isn't populated. I probably don't even need this cap anymore, but I've just been too lazy to remove it. Um, but at any rate, here, we'll put that back on there. Um, that's where all our power comes in, is at that rectification point. And from there, uh, where we used to have regulators, uh, we're just jumping them over. That's uh, The input is just bridged right over to the output. Same with our 12 volt regulator there. The input is just bridged over to the output. So this machine runs on a single 5 volt supply. There's nothing else uh, coming in here for power. No AC, no 12 volt, no step up rectified to 18 and step back down linear regulators. All that junk is gone. We, we are 5 volts and 5 volts only. Um, so we're outputting 5 volt to the two 12 volt pins uh, where you'd have a VIC and a SID, but we have the Kawari and this thing's a beast and a half and we'll get into that in a little bit but um uh, the quarry doesn't even use that pin for anything it just runs off the uh, uh i think the 12 volt pin is what pin 13 or 14 on this thing 12 or 13 whatever it is uh that pin is not even used uh so there's five volt going to it but it doesn't matter uh the original five volt pin is i believe it's pin 40 on this and uh that that's where this module gets all his power from so it doesn't matter that we're running 5 12 or nothing and on that 12 volt leg um, for the arm SID, it does run off that supply pin there, um, and typically you would have 12 volt or 9 volt there, uh, but you know, it's just an arm chip on there. This guy runs just fine off 5 volts. Uh, you might have issues with detection of 6581 versus 8580, you know, if you have an old SID or a new SID that you're trying to replace, but um, it's easy enough to just go in the config program and tell it what it's replacing. So. Um, at any rate, yeah, I, we, we only need 5 volts to run this machine now. Um, this was our uh, little oscillator circuit that, uh, that we built up so we could feed the, the uh, uh, time of day clocks in the CIAs, and that guy's been working pretty good. I, I did manage to find the right crystal for it. If you saw the first video, you saw I used a close crystal, but uh, no, we, we got a, a real 3.579 color burst crystal in there with that Elm 440 chip, and uh, that thing works really well. Um, so yeah, that, that's our power section. Uh, obviously, he is doing all the video stuff. I have depopulated uh, all the clock circuits from the board. We're running on the internal clock. Uh, there is uh, some downfall for that, uh, which if I had read the manual <laughs> before I did all this, I might have left the original clock circuit on the board. Um, and the, the downfall there is uh, pin 6 on the, on the cartridge slot would have the dot clock, and some cartridges need that. They're few and far between, but uh, one of them is the GeoRAM cartridge. Um, I, I bet the Commodore REUs need it as well. Um, so if you need the dot clock on, on the external port, you're going to want to stick with the onboard oscillators. Um, anyway, let's uh, back up a little here. Anything else to write home about? No, everything else is pretty well standard. Um, 
know, on, on this half of the board, uh, on this Melius board, of course, you can run regular uh, EEPROMs or EEPROMs. So those are just, you know, run of the mill, uh, you know, 27C, 256s or 512s or whatever I threw in there. Um, so we're, we're down to only three MOS chips left in this machine, the, the 6510 and the, uh, the CIAs, the 6526s. Everything else can be bought for the most part off the shelf today. Um, so anyway, we'll, uh, let's get rejiggered here for some, uh, some voltage test. All right, here we go. Our, our little box is running and we are, uh, we're feeding, uh, with a, a bench power supply set of 12 volts right now. Uh, there's the output from our regulator and you can see at 12 volts, we're pulling, uh, 350 milliamp. Um, what does that come out to? Four and a half watts. Um, it's, it's not a lot. Uh, the, this uh, machine with uh, all the aftermarket chips and everything else is, is very, very efficient. Very little power has gone to waste here. So there's very little heat being generated in the machine, which is wonderful. Um, so uh, let's see. Let's, let's crank our voltage up. Say you wanted to run this machine off an old laptop power supply. You know, they put out usually, you know, 19, 19 and a half, some of them are 20 volts, I guess. Uh, but you could, you could repurpose an old laptop power supply to be the power brick for this. Um, as you saw, we were running at uh, 12 volts, so you can run it off a battery, 12 volt power brick. Uh, a lot of old power supplies from external hard drives are 12 volt. You know, you can find 12 volt anywhere. Um, and then, uh, see, I know there's, there's nine volt bricks out there. Uh, you can probably run this thing off a 9-volt battery for a few minutes. Um, uh, there's there's seven 7.5-volt seven devices out there that uh, typically RC car chargers, whatever. You might have an old charger laying around. You can use that as a power brick for this thing. Um, now, as you get close to the 5-volt mark, that's where things start to get... Uh, not terribly interesting, but you just gotta just gotta think about what you're doing for a minute. So I've got this regulator set at 4.9 volts. Um, there there was a little bit of thought that went into that, and I mean a little bit of thought. Um, so our regulator, the XL4015, he he basically has overhead of about 0 0.3, 0 0.4 volts, right? Um, so as you get close to uh, uh, what it's set at, if you're set at 5 volt, you got to feed it about 5.35, 5.4 in order to get your 5 volt stable out of it. After that, it starts dropping off. Uh, so to buy back a little headroom, and, and the C64s, I've seen them run down around 4.6 volts. You know, 4.7, 4.8, 4.9 is, is perfectly safe for them. Um, I'd rather be a little under 5 than over 5. Um, that's just my thought on the situation. But at any rate, um, so as we get close to the 5 volt mark, we will start to, to drop off, right? But we can go down real slowly here. What, 5.5 volts? We're still putting out our 4.9. Uh, now we're getting into cell phone charger range here, right? Uh, a lot of cell phone chargers will put out, or Raspberry Pi power supplies will, will put out just a hair over five, like five, two, five, three. Um, so if we come down, yeah, that's where we start losing our voltage is right at the 5.3 mark. I, I know there are quite a few Raspberry Pi power bricks that are rated at five volt, two and a half amp or five volt, three amp. And they'll typically put out a little over five. They'll get you in the five, two, five, three range usually. So I think we're approaching the point we could probably because even at, at five even going in, we're still four and a half out. The machine's still running. Now, and this is right on the edge. I mean, the text is starting to get a little dimmer, right? Um, so that, that's probably a little too low. But if, uh, if you can keep it at, say, 5.2 in, you know, 4.7, I know these machines still run reliably. So if you can keep it around 5.2 in, I think we're at the point where we can run this thing off a Raspberry Pi power brick, you know, a, a you know five volt, two and a half, or three amp power brick uh, that are very common in the Pi world. Um, so uh, yeah, anyway, that's uh, that's the machine running off various different voltages. Uh, very very lean and mean little box now. So uh, let me let me get set up for capture and all that, and we'll play with the quarry a little bit.
Now right, we're all booted up and hopefully capturing, and we're going to do my favorite thing uh, with the Kawari, and that's 80 column mode. And, uh, you know, 80 column and basic is, is all well and good. Um, I spent tons of time on BVSs with my Commodore back in the day, and there was uh, uh, Nova Term, which has been rebranded as Strike Term and, and rebuilt and made a little more modernized. And the uh, the Nova Term driver was was you know for eighty column was hacky and slow and weird and and you know just hard to look at. But I I used it. Lots of people did. So um, we're gonna check out the Kawari eighty column driver, which is much better. So uh, first thing we got to do is load this ANSI driver of sorts. And if you notice, it changes the color palette. And that's because the the ANSI driver was pulling the palette directly from the Kawari. Um, so this, uh, this little, uh, driver patcher of sorts, uh, Mr. Rossi provided to me is, uh, it, it tweaks the colors so the ANSI colors look right. So now that we've loaded that, we can load strike term and, uh, loads well, quick enough off the SD to IEC at least. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, if you notice it just scrolled across 80 column Kawari and, uh, Probably would have been better if I plugged in the modem first, but that's all right. We can still play around in the terminal. So uh, if you go into advanced config, you can uh, you can set your 80 column driver there, uh, and we are set for for the Kawari already. So here we'll go back into our terminal, and uh, yeah, this is a very smooth and workable and fast and good 80 column driver compared to the the original. Uh, uh, Nova term driver, which was pretty ugly looking. So uh, here, if we go back, hang on. If we, if we go back into advanced config, and let's change our 80 column driver to the default. We'll go back into the terminal. You can see how how blocky and ugly and and just bad the original driver was right you know it, it was it was the best that could be done back in the day and it worked but uh you know the 80 column of the quarry is much better so let's remember to plug in the modem this time and uh hopefully we'll we'll get a patch version of the of the quarry driver for nova term that that does this uh this ansi patch for us um, if I knew what I was doing, maybe I could actually patch the driver. Maybe I'll have to, I'll have to learn a bit, but here we'll load that back into the file browser and load strike term. It's a minor inconvenience. And we're up. I remember waiting what seemed for an eternity loading this off 1541s back in the day. But uh, all this stuff runs real well off the SD to IEC. So like, like I said earlier, I mean, this is a, a great combination of all the projects coming together. I have the, you know, the user port Wi-Fi modem, the, the Commodore CAS one, uh, the SD to IEC, a Quarry, an ARMSID, and we have a, a pretty darn modern 8-bit computer at this point. So if we go into our terminal, initialize the modem, and we are alive. I have a speed dial set up for an 80 column BBS that I frequent. Of course, I hit the wrong number. So yeah, all, all the uh, you know ANSI art stuff looks pretty good. I was already logged in on another box, but here we go. We are logged in. All right, here's one more almost practical use for an 80 column Commodore 64 in our present day and age. Um, public shell accounts, those are still a thing. Who'd have thought? Um, they were real popular in the 80s, even the early 90s. Uh, you got one through college or work or whatever, but there are also public free shell accounts out there. And uh, this stuff still exists. So SDF is still out there. They were they've been around a long, long time. Um, 
So uh, yeah, I keep them on speed dial as well. Actually, we need to go into Telnet mode for these guys. Can't use RAW mode like a BBS. Like most BBSs do support RAW socket mode, um, but uh, we will enable Telnet mode and use our speed dial. No oh, answer. There we go. And there we go. We're on a, an honest to goodness Unix shell. This is how you got on the internet back in the day before GUIs and clicky things. But uh, yeah, you can uh, use Pine. There's Elm or all the other mail clients here. We can come into Pine and hit M for mail. To oh no, oh, Shift two is not the at symbol on this computer. Now we're writing an email. And what do we do? We got to exit control X. We want to save our modified buffer. Default file name is fine. Now we're back in the mail client. Y to send. Mail sent. And that's how email worked a hundred years ago on the internet, kids. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the internet in text mode for you. In 80 column glory. Okay, here's some extra credit. Uh, let's talk about the dot clock a little bit. So, um... When using the oscillator on the quarry, the, the dot clock uh, is not brought out on pin 22 and sent over to the uh, sent over to the, the expansion slot or, or any of that stuff. Um, reason being is that there, there's a whole oscillator circuit still running on the board and you would have some major problems there. So uh, the wonderful creator of the quarry board, Mr. Rossi, he put together a custom firmware that brings the dot clock out on that pin of the LS, I forget what it is, it's a 74 LS chip, right? I guess he was using that as a reset line, um, but it really wasn't needed for anything. So uh, he was able to write firmware that repurposed that pin as the, uh, the 8 meg dot clock on no, NTSC anyway, it's 8 point. 181818 uh, and pal it's 7.9 something i forget um i haven't tested it in pal yet but uh in ntsc it is working just fine uh so it's just a matter of tacking a little wire onto that pin and then on the on the 407 board um this slot here is where you used to have a, a 74 ls 629 and that was the you know, the heart and soul, the clock circuit on the 407 boards. Um, so obviously you need to completely depopulate the entire clock circuit on the board if you want to do this. Otherwise you're going to damage things, right? You just can't have two clocks blasting at each other. That'd be very, very bad. So, uh, so yeah, I had removed these sockets anyway to fit this monstrosity in here. So uh, it was just a matter of going to pin 7 of the LS629 uh, or of where the LS629 used to be anyway, I should say. And so now we have uh, uh, Randy's clock coming out of that uh, logic on the quarry board. This is just a little jumper wire that runs into pin 7 of that socket. And then what pin 7 does is goes through this ferrite bead, what used to be a ferrite bead here. This I swapped out. This is a, a 200 ohm resistor. Um, that's just because I had a 200 ohm laying on the bench and I was too lazy to go digging for parts. Um, this is just for some current limiting. Uh, you could probably use a, a 30 ohm, 50 ohm, 100 ohm, just some kind of low value resistor to do some current limiting to protect the FPGA from 
anything bad that might happen on the rest of the board here, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, it's just a matter of depopulating this section, running the wire into pin 7 where the 629 used to be, and I put that, uh, that resistor in place of the ferrite bead there. Uh, this cap C36, um, he's just a cap to ground for, for smoothing on that circuit, so he's no problem to leave in there. It's probably a good thing to leave in there anyway, and that gets the dot clock going out to the uh, to pin six of your your expansion port and uh, yeah so that's uh, that's some awesome stuff he turned around that firmware in a couple of days for us and uh, so far it runs like a champ so I'm gonna rig up the scope and uh, switch it into PAL mode and all that other good stuff and, and make sure the clocks are, are working as expected all right, we've had this machine running for a couple of hours now, and it is stable, happy, and good as far as I could tell. So um, here in the upper left corner, we have the output of our scope, and the uh, the top line there, uh, we're running in PAL mode, so the, the, uh, the top trace there is the 7.88 clock. Uh, it's the dot clock running in yellow, and uh, uh, the purple trace on the bottom, that's the uh, the main clock the cpu clock so he's running you know right at 985 like he showed the dot clocks running like he should so we uh we've removed our led and put a toggle switch instead so if we flip that and cycle the machine comes right back up in ntsc mode with the 8.18 clock for the dot and 1.02 on the CPU. So yeah, this thing's real good. I, I've let it run multiple passes and everything's been fine for diagnostics. Ignore the little flickering you see out of there. That's the capture card. It, it tends to freak out when you go back and forth between NTSC and PAL. I think the capture card's really NTSC only. So I'm lucky it works at all. Uh, but at any rate, this is a happy little machine here. So I, I think our clocks are good. I, I think our, our little bodgy bodgy there is uh, definitely a workable solution. And uh, yeah, I think that's about it. So you know, I've, I've said it a few times, I think, throughout the last couple of days when I've been recording these clips. But uh, this is an awesome combination of everybody's hard work coming together. I'm just the guy that put it together. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Chris that did the Melius board and... Uh, Mr. Rossi, who did our Kawari and, you know, the, the Armstead folks over there in Europe, the Gal PLA guy, I forget that guy's name. Um, but, you know, a little bit of everything went in to, to make, you know, this machine what it is. So uh, thank you all for these wonderful projects. Keep them coming, and I will keep buying this stuff. So Anyway, I think that's going to be the last clip for this one. I'm tired. I need to go to bed. But uh, take care, everybody. And uh, we'll, uh, we got a couple more things in store for this thing. So this machine ain't done yet. Stay tuned. There will be more videos and, and more things bolted in here.